Our sermon today is entitled simply, Together. And I hope that when we get to the end of this message, you will realize the value, the weight, and the wonder of that word in the context of what we will study today. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Our study will primarily focus on one verse today, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. For those of you who are guests, we welcome you. I preach from the New King James Version of the Bible, and that's what will appear on the screen. Mark 8, verse 34, and when he, that's Jesus, had called the people to him with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let's look at this in its context so we can understand it better. This is taking place in the region of Caesarea Philippi, about 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, primarily in a Gentile region. It is late summer. Jesus will die on the cross the following spring. He takes his closest followers with him on this journey, and he asks them two questions. One, who do men say that I am? And then two, who do you say that I am? And Peter declares for them that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Essentially, he's saying you are the Savior. In verse 31 of chapter 8, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus introduces at this time in his ministry the idea of a suffering Savior. It was not familiar to the Jewish people that lived then. They were looking for a political conquering hero type of Savior. Jesus was going to help them conquer themselves spiritually. They were unprepared for him to be a suffering Savior that would be tormented and die on a cross. It's so repulsive to their minds that Peter, as a spokesman for them, in verse 32 it says, he spoke this word openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. We studied this at length last week, what it means. I would encourage you to get that sermon if you'd like to be caught up entirely. Verse 33, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So Jesus, in this context, we come to verse 34 and his comments. Verse 34 says, And when he had called the people to him, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. We have the Savior declaration. We have the suffering Savior declaration. And now we have the cost of following the Savior given to us. This is the cost of being a true follower of Jesus. Notice how the verse begins. It says, And when he had called the people to him with his disciples, it is to a larger gathering that he gives this message. This is important for us as we see this is not a special process for the spiritual elite. It is not just for the inner circle, not just for the twelve. What Jesus is saying here is for everyone and anyone who would be his follower. So it definitely includes us. He uses the phrase, anyone 
who would come after me. Now this phrase we can understand better if we see how this Greek is used in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, verse 40, the words of Jesus, he says this, But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So coming to Jesus is describing accepting him as our Savior, following him, becoming a disciple of his, and believing in his teachings. It is entering into a fellowship with him that we might be saved. So Jesus is saying anyone who wants the salvation experience, let him deny himself. Now this phrase, deny himself, is a rich expression in the Word of God. It has a number of flavors to it that all make it rich. Forget self, ignore self, disown self, lose sight of self, lose sight of personal and own interests. If you want to study this word in a casual way, but yet have it open before you, this is the identical word that is used when Jesus says Peter would deny him. Follow that storyline and see how vehement Peter is denying that he even knows Jesus, that he's ever been with him, he doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. It is very strong. It is very forceful. And so Jesus says, whoever wants to fellowship with me in salvation, let him deny himself. What's the problem? Well, the problem is because of sin, we're born with a sinful nature. And the plan of redemption is to restore within us the image of God to conquer that sinful nature, if you will. We are saved from sin and from the condemnation of sin, but in reality we are saved from ourselves as we learn to walk with Jesus. You see, because of sinfulness, we are born very insecure. We are born naturally with a low self-esteem. We have crippling inferiority and feelings of worthlessness. And all this is there inherent within us. And it can be made worse by childhood trauma, tragedy of being unwanted and unloved. It can be enhanced by the pressure of a competitive society like we live in, political, economic oppression, things or people that demean us. It could be racial and sexual prejudice, technology which enhances loneliness. It could be suffering from abusive relationships. All these things are the experience of humanity. And in order to deal with the problem of self, there has been a birth of the cult of self, the religion of self-deification, where we are God, and we should acknowledge that, honor that, worship ourselves. Many, many parts of psychology today has simply become a religion in the form of secular humanism based on the concept of the worship of self. It teaches intrinsic goodness of human nature, not what the Bible teaches. 
The Bible teaches we are basically bad. We must be converted. Secular humanism teaches we are basically good. Just build on that. It teaches the need for unconditional self-regard, self-awareness, self-actualization. Self is God. Obey it. Follow it. Deny all others. It boils down to this. I love me. Be your best friend. Do whatever makes you feel good. It is self-absorption that will make you happy. In commenting on this way back in 1977 in the magazine Christianity Today, John Piper quoted this poem. There once was a nymph named Narcissus who thought himself very delicious. So he stared like a fool at his face in a pool and his folly today is still with us. We have become a society of narcissists. It's all about us. And it's gotten so crazy if someone declares they are something they are not, we're supposed to honor that. I have a hard time honoring crazy. How about you? You know, if we can be whatever we identify as, I told my wife, Karen, next time she goes to the doctor, don't bother weighing in. Just say, today I'm identifying at 135. <laughs> That's how nuts it is. Paul told us these days were coming, 2 Timothy chapter 3. When Paul describes last days, he doesn't bother about pestilences and earthquakes and wars. He talks about human behavior. In 2 Timothy 3, he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. You see, the power of God is such that we can defeat the God of self within our hearts. In fact, that's what the Lord wants to do for us. But there's confusion. People will even use the Bible to justify a love of self. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Jesus comments... Matthew 22, we look at verse 37. Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and this the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. From that saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, has come the cult of self-love sprinkled into the church. That really means the emphasis is this, of doing no harm to your neighbor, just as you would not do harm to yourself. That's what it means. It is not self-absorption which would be contrary to loving your neighbor anyways, because if I love me more than I love thee, then I'm going to do what I want to do regardless of its effect upon you. You see how it's contradictory. It doesn't work. So we go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. 
The great enemy that we struggle with is not outside of us. It is within us. It is our sinful nature wanting to express itself and wanting to entertain itself and wanting to follow itself. So Jesus says, let him deny himself. Disown self and self-interest and put them on the side of God. Now we will look at that again in just a moment. But the next thing that Jesus says, and take up his cross. Notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say take up a cross. You must take up your own cross. You can't have a cross for someone else. They can't have a cross for you. It is your own cross. And let's be very clear. This is not talking about difficulties in life. This is not referring to that woman who says, oh, being married to that man, it's just the cross I bear. That's, he may be hard to live with and difficult and all that, but that's not biblical. He is not the cross you wear. Difficulties, pain, sorrow are not the crosses we bear. You see, when this was written and when Jesus commented on it, there was only one cross, one purpose for a cross, and that was to murder the criminals of Rome. And when it says, take up your cross, the only person who took up a cross in that day was someone who had been sentenced to death. And they are carrying either the crossbar or the entire cross to their death. It is somebody walking with a death sentence upon them. It is their cross, and they carry that cross, the instrument of death. They carry that cross to certain death. And that death spiritually is death to self. It is death to self being in control. And it is alive to letting God be God in our lives. It is living out in reality, not my will, but God's will be done. Paul refers to it in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. And in Galatians 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. Paul is saying here, I took that slimy, awful, person of self and nailed it to a cross. And now Jesus lives inside of me instead of that. And Paul is saying at every juncture he's yielding his will to the will of God. Now Paul will describe the awful experience of religion and trying to be good in Romans chapter 7. And he screams out in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? If you go to 8 verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. They have crucified the flesh. But it begs a question. What hope is there in, in this? I mean, really. How do you sincerely deny yourself and pick up this awful instrument of death called the cross. 
and what kind of religion is it? In Jesus' day, it was proliferating with the Jews. They were continually seeking to deprive themselves food, stimulants, pleasures, even looking at women just to see them would cause some to go crazy. And so it can't be that, nor can it be this. I'll tell you a story, a true story. But before I tell it, let me tell you why I'm telling it. Some have made a religion out of denying themselves. That's not what Jesus is talking about. I was in graduate school. The professor was a man that grew up in England. He grew up in England during World War II. And he was teaching us and told us a story about three British soldiers, three young men who had been drafted into the British Army. They were Seventh-day Adventists, high in scruples. And during boot camp, they were assigned to work and do training on the Sabbath. They refused. So their names were brought up to the person in charge. And they said, we will not work on the Sabbath. And there were other men there who were believers in the Lord, but they worshiped on Sunday. So the question went to them, would you also not work on Sunday? And that group said, no, we don't want to work on Sunday either. Well, how convicted are you about it? Well, yeah, really strong. These three guys say they would rather be killed than work on Saturday. Do you have those convictions about Sunday? They said, no, we wouldn't take it that far. So you have three guys willing to be killed because they will not work on Saturday. Well, this was a real dilemma. They needed those men to work. They needed those men to be trained. The whole unit depended on everybody doing their job. So the man over that man is brought in on it. And he begins to inquire. And as it's unfolding, he discovers these three men won't budge. Somehow in the conversation, he discovers they don't drink tea. British, not drinking tea. They won't even eat cheese. They won't eat meat. They won't partake in any food that has dairy in it. And this commanding officer is scratching his head. And the three Adventists know the dilemma he's in, and the spokesman of them said, Sir, we understand you don't want to put us in prison. We get that. But we understand you probably have to. And he said, Look at it from our perspective. We won't work on the Sabbath, we don't drink tea. We don't watch movies. We don't play cards. We have a very careful diet. We don't dance. And they just went right on down. And his conclusion was, sir, put us in prison. It would deprive us of nothing. <laughs> True story. Some people have made a religion out of denying themselves. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about removing self from the throne in your heart and having Jesus sit there instead. And here's the good news. Jesus says in verse 34, take up your cross and follow me. 
Now this haunts me. On the surface, I don't like that picture. Follow Jesus. There's the path. Blood-stained path. Follow Jesus. You want him to be your master? You want to be his disciple? Follow Jesus. The guy never got married, never owned a home, never had a job. Once he left his work. And that's supposed to be me? There is no appeal to that whatsoever. None. But that's apparently what it's saying. It's not what it's saying. Think of it. Following Jesus would at best, if I get to see him, would be looking at his backside. That just screams lonely to me. And how often do we get to see him anyways? And so it just screams duty, drudgery, this walking, this awful path, saying, glad I'm going to heaven, glad I'm going to heaven. Here's your hope. Here's your good news. This phrase in the Greek doesn't mean to follow after someone. It means to walk with me. We will take the same road together. It is not Jesus in the front. It is Jesus at the side. My arm around him. His arm around me. And we are walking together. And I want you to know, folks, that's a huge difference in my mind. Because that is the Lord, step in step with me, helping me, blessing me, protecting me, giving me wisdom, giving me understanding, giving me patience. As long as He is Lord in my heart, He will be Lord at my side, and we will walk together. The appeal from Jesus in this passage is a beautiful thing. He is saying, don't listen to yourself. Don't listen to your opinion of yourself. Listen to God's opinion of you. Now in Scripture, everything is balanced that is right. On one side, our, our self is an ugly, ugly thing. But in Jesus, we find we can let Him be on the throne, and our self actually is ennobled with a beautiful, virtuous concept of redemption where I go from awful to being a child of God, being family with God, inheriting what Jesus inherits. He's not only my Savior. He's not only my Lord. He is my brother. And we are family. God's family. Can you have any more worth than that? And Jesus saying, Here's your worth. God so loved you, He sent me to die for you. What is your worth? So Jesus is saying, look, whoever wants to walk with me in fellowship, let him forget what self is saying and listen to what God says. Acknowledge the path to death in the crucifixion of self. Deny it. Starve it. Do whatever you want. Don't allow it to express itself. And we will walk together side by side on a common path towards heaven. So let's look at Mark 8.34. Let's read it out loud. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, 
whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Simple question today. Is there anyone here who would like to say to God, I am willing for you to be God in my life, and I want to walk with Jesus. If you want to say that to him, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, please be God in our hearts. Help us to truly be repulsed by self and let you and your will be done in our lives. And may we, by your grace, walk arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.